Um, I hope he's all well. It seems as though it's been quite a long time, like weeks wise, since we've last met. Um, and the next time we meet, for those who are going away on the overnight, it will be on the 26th. So we won't be having a Hope Women night, but don't worry, because I know some people can't make it. We will take the teachings and we'll make sure that you get a copy of them, because we don't want anybody missing out on that. Um, and I always like to mention, and I'm sure each and everybody is loving the section in church that we're getting taught just now, in the self-denying life of a servant of Christ. And again, I just think it's so fitting for where we find ourselves in our study, um, as we're being exhorted, really, to continue to wage this war against our flesh. Um, not only against the spiritual snobs that we've learned about, but... I had taken some notes on Sunday and I believe this will also help us from what Mark said because um, it was really challenging um, from what it is that we need to learn for tonight and it was if we're not hungering and thirsting after God and his word it's not because we are not readers and studiers etc it's because we are hungering and thirsting after our own flesh mm -hmm. nothing else so tonight it's my prayer that we hunger and thirst for God and his word. So let's pray. <clears throat> Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us that we may in such a way hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And that's from the Book of Common Prayer. Amen. 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 So as you all know, the scripture for our study is found in Galatians 5, and it's verses 22 to 23, and says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So just to give a recap from last month, um, you know, I mentioned last month that in the Greek what the Holy Spirit and its fruit actually was. So um, if the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son dwells in us, that's whose spirit we walk in. That's the spirit that we've got in us. And the word for that was um, peripatio, and it means to walk, to live, and to conduct ourselves, to regulate one's life, and to live, to live for Christ. Um, really that's what our studies are about that's what we're learning in church it's really about denying ourselves and our selfish ambition mm -hmm. picking up our cross daily and following christ and when we spoke about love last time um it was really quite powerful when we realized that love was totally the linchpin on everything it really is the greatest of everything as it said in the scripture um we learned in 1 corinthians 13 verses 1 to 3 if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy going or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as not to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all, give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And I was thinking about the spiritual snobbery, you know, I think there's a lot of spiritual snobs who think that they've got all that, but they've zero love. So really, they've got nothing. Um, and I wondered if, like me, your conviction is stronger now than that you've had time to kind of reflect over the last teaching, study it, listen to it probably again. Um, and I shared a quote from Mark last month that love is a fruit, is a bedrock that truly measures our whole Christianity. I know certainly for me over the last number of weeks is since we met that's become much more prominent in my walk every day that um, it's really really important that we have God's love um, and as we know we Paul wrote in Romans 5 5 that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us I mentioned last month that the love of God poured into our hearts um, it was poured into our hearts the moment we got saved. God knew from the beginning of time he was one day going to pour his love into us and the moment he did our lives changed forever and that pouring in now must become our pouring out. We are to walk that out every moment of our lives. 
In Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, to express the fruit of love is to live in deep communion, gratitude, awe and wonder with the one who poured his love on us. When we were still sinners, who are we not to love? Who are we not to forgive? Who are we not to show grace? Who are we to take offence? And ladies, truly, if we are living that life, then we get to experience joy, which is the second um, fruit of the Spirit. And really, if you don't have love, you have nothing. So even though we're going to talk about joy in your life, and if you're joyless, then the truth is you don't have love, because love, as we know, is the greatest of them all. So I think as we go on in our studies, we'll learn that, we'll be able to see that. Um, and I just want to remind people the the two foundations that we have to just always, and I think this has become so apparent to me when I listen to the messages on a Sunday, I just keep thinking I'm going to have to wage war in my flesh. If I'm not waging war in my flesh, then really I'm not going to experience much of God. It won't really matter what Mark preaches on a Sunday, what we hear on a Sunday night, what we learn in our prayer meeting, what I say, nothing is going to matter if, unless we actually decide that we're going to wage war on our flesh, because we'll be so consumed, desiring and hungering and thirsting after everything but God, that there's no room, we just strangle and we strangle God out. So there's, we have to make a commitment that that's what we're going to do individually. Um, you don't have to do it, but I can only strongly suggest that you do if you want to live and experience the fruit of God's Spirit working through you in your life for His glory. Um, so the foundation is that as soon as we get saved, as soon as we repent of our sin and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we at that moment are given God's Spirit. Without a doubt, you are given God's Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit is yours it's in you, you've got the indwelling spirit of God, he's there and he's wanting to manifest who he is in your life and through your life and we always, always have the bo- our old flesh which is our old sinful nature, that will never leave us until we're like what was happening in that hymn when we are actually in the presence of God where it's totally removed and we're totally free from our sinful lives, our sinful selves And we're made new in Christ and we're able to worship and love God and serve him and praise him and worship him. Um, So it's just a tension that we're always going to have. And um, it's something that every day or every week, uh, sometimes more than others, it just, it's always there. I'm not going to forget this. I need to wage war against my own flesh. And I have to be honest, I'm nowhere near where I should be. Um, and I'm challenging myself to constantly take capture my thoughts, don't run away with this in my head or get caught up in something else and bringing myself back into my daily disciplines or focusing on God rather than just focusing on self. And we are in a spiritual battle and that's the reality of being a Christian. Um, but I think for me, again, just as I said earlier, I've just been seeing different things and I'll talk a bit about it in the message of maybe people dying and, you know, some meeting Christ who are in Christ and some probably not in Christ, um, is that really you won't imagine Jesus saying to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that's really what we're living for as believers. That's the focus that we should have. That should be our goal <coughs> so that Jesus can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, I'm, people get to heaven, as we know about the thief on the cross, and I don't know that Jesus could say the thief, well done, <laughs> good and faithful servant, but if we're believers in our walk and earth is longer than our time we've been believing and dying, then really we do want God, well, I do, to be able to say that to me. Um, so what is joy then? Let's move on to joy. Let's get into joy. Um, <clears throat> I love what John MacArthur says. He says that joy always is to signify a feeling of happiness that is based on spiritual realities. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well be- between him and himself and the Lord. 
It is not an experience that comes from favourable circumstances or even a human emotion that is divinely stimulated. It is God's gift to believers. And it's just, it's back to that moment when you get saved. That is what God gives you. Um, it's in us, it's there. We might need to deal with stuff to really get it manifest in our life, but we have joy within us. Um, and I don't know if some of you have seen this, but I've seen this kind of worked out, being walked out, I feel like, in Twitter recently. And um, there's a man called Michael Colgan and his wife Erin, and they live in America. Their daughter, I think she might be about 20, 21, um, sadly had been drinking alcohol, made poor choices, and basically ended up in a life support machine. Um, and this was like a couple of weeks ago because Phil Johnson from Grace Community Church had tweeted about it. And Justin Peters had tweeted about it and were just saying, can you please pray for this beloved brother? They're going through a really horrific time. Um, and so I started kind of looking into it so that I could follow it and pray. And um, and when it started, this man was sharing things, but then he'd write like some blogs um, about what was happening to his daughter and how him and his wife were having to try and navigate this. Um, you know, they're... The daughter had a wee toddler and they were having to make sure the toddler was taken away, you know, by a gran to make sure that it was taken care of. So you can imagine it was quite messy and the girl's lifestyle was really quite chaotic. Um, and it transpired that doctors were telling them that, listen, we believe there's no hope for your daughter. She's brain dead. Um, and like just what that must have felt like for them and what I observed watching this kind of roll out I feel like was this man's joy in God it was, and if you read any of um, tweets of his blogs I promise you unless you've got a heart of stone that will deeply move you mm. his love and joy and the way he writes about this whole situation and it was his joy in the Lord regardless of the terrible circumstances that has enabled him to do that so I'll explain a bit further. Michael, he had disclosed that it, that they, him and his wife had adopted this girl. It was their second marriage. They probably get saved, you know what it's like. Um, and they'd adopted, her name was Bailey as a child. And if you read between the lines, you know, she obviously was quite a troubled girl. And you can imagine the stress and the trials of a godly couple trying to help rebuild their lives, getting saved because we've all got a past and then trying to support this young girl. But obviously the doctors had said there's just no brain activity and really we need to look at removing our life support. And it was like, you can imagine, or I could imagine, I thought, there's these two believers. They know God's word. They know about the doctrines of grace. And here's doctors saying to them, we really need you to decide to turn the life support machine off. And they, can you imagine their fear, thinking nothing in our daughter's life would represent that she knows Christ. Mm. We're going to have to decide to switch off that she meets God that could mean she goes to hell. I mean, it's just it's just unimaginable having to be put in that position. Um, and I was trying to imagine like their fear and their dread and having to navigate that. But again, see if you read these blog and these posts like how asking people to pray and how they're seeking God and it's truly one of the most humbling things I've ever seen um, and how like there was timelines that didn't work out because the doctors asked could we donate our organs and um, they decided that it was going to be a day and a time and that's when they would turn it off and um, when that day came he wrote about how he sees the pain he seen his daughter grasping for breath and I couldn't do anything about it because she was all intent purposes away but how their hope was in God and praying that God could do anything like the thief in the cross and we don't know what God does or doesn't and there was a window where she could have donated her organs to like seven people but in God's providence and this is the thing God's in charge it had to be within like for her liver to be um, donated you need, you need you need to die within 20 minutes apparently but she had died like 35 minutes, so she missed the window for all her organs to be delivered, so other people's hopes would be dashed. But they would say things like, but you know, God um, works all things out together for his purpose. We don't know what God's doing in that. And you saw God's providence in the whole situation. And yeah, him and his wife are 
quoting the scriptures, they're witnessing the doctors, they're taking in tracks into the hospital for other people. I mean, truly, I've been totally blown away with how this couple have represented God in the most horrific situations and how even now, after sadly that she's passed away, he's out and he's continuing a different work and he's helping people. I mean, it's just wonderful. And really, it's it's just joy. Mm. It's knowing God at that <clears throat> deep level that John MacArthur speaks about, that it doesn't matter what's going on, that's where their hope is, that's where their trust is, mm. and they have to trust God with that girl. What can you do? There's just nothing you can do. And it just reminded me of the scripture in Romans 8 and verse 35, and I see it working out in their life where Paul says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That couple know and believe fully what it means in Romans 8, 28. And, the, and we know that all things work yeah. together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I had that conversation with somebody on mm -hmm. Sunday just mm -hmm. saying, you know, God's working all things out for good. We might not know what that good is. We might never know what that good is. But if we love God and we are the called according to his purpose, then it's, we say, he says that it's all things. So God's working all things out, mm -hmm. however God does. But doesn't it just help your joy believing in God's sovereignty? So good that God's in charge, isn't it? Just thank goodness we're not in charge. If I was in charge, it would be chaos, honestly. You're not hoping in. Whereas God's in charge. Um, and uh, just to see that live pan out in somebody's life has <coughs> just really blessed my faith and really helped my faith. Um, and as I say, I would encourage you to go in and find him. And I'll find his link and I can send you that. I'll get Donna to text you it so that if you want to go in and read his blogs, because... They truly are enriching as a believer. Um, so if we are a believer and we are knowing God's word and we're following Christ, we get to experience that joy, Lord. As I said earlier, what John MacArthur said, that it's a deep down sense of well-being that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well between himself and the Lord. Nothing can separate you from that. It doesn't matter what happened, not even death can separate you from that. What a promise, what a hope, what a reassurance that all hell can be breaking loose. You could lose everything in your life, but Jesus says you'll never lose him. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, and nobody can take you out of his hand. And I believe, as I watched that couple go through that, that's, that's what they were living, but they were joyful. Um... And it's true that joy cannot be attained by any other means except that which comes as a gift from God. You just can't get it. Um, the world, whereas, and everybody in it, they deeply desire joy. Um, and therefore, they go on a pursuit to actually attain it, and it can be relentless, and it can be vast. People spend all their life trying to find it, which they can't because it's only found in the person of Jesus Christ. And I know that, I've lived that life, searching everywhere. And really it is only found in Christ Jesus. Um, and when I say the world is searching for joy, it's probably not really that accurate. Because really, how do you explain joy that I've just described to you with that couple to non-believers? How can you really articulate it and them they understand it whereas you understand it if you know christ you understand that deep joy but as someone outside christ they, they, they don't really they can't understand it and um, so you can't really explain it or fully express it outside your relationship with god um whereas in the life of michael and erin you can witness their true joy in the most <coughs> as i say horrendous situation um and that there's nothing in the world, no matter what happens, that it can't give them that. Um, so it's really not joy then that the world seeks. So what is it that they're actually seeking if it's not joy, if they don't know Christ and they can't find it within Christ? It's a deep yearning and you can probably well relate to this. And if you don't know God, you'll relate to this in your life. 
It's a deep yearning to be satisfied as a result of the pain of disappointment and dissatisfaction. Think about it. When I, before I knew God, I had a lot of pain and a lot of dissatisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction, you know. No wonder Mick Jagger's saying, I think they're still, they're still living, <laughs> I can't get any satisfaction. Um, but, now I wasn't consciously thinking I'm in pain because of disappointment, but it, it's like an envelope, it just covers your whole life. Mm it covers your whole mind, your whole beliefs and your whole actions, your whole seeking, your whole striving. It just it just envelopes you like a wee cloud and people won't remember um, Charlie Brown but he used to walk about with a wee cloud over him at times and it would be raining. It'd only be raining in him, it wasn't raining in anybody else, just him. I love Charlie Brown, it was great. Um but that's what it's like and it's just it's enveloped your life. Um so really, nobody's looking for joy um, because it can't be found. So what they're looking for is they're looking for things that make them feel good or feel loved or feel worthy or feel happy. And it's in those moments, fleeting as they are, that people think that they've got joy. They think they are complete. And then when the feelings subside, they once again lose their sense of contentment and joy. And it's their dissatisfaction that then fuels their next pursuit. Um, I was talking to Grace today and she was talking about somebody and they're like, oh, they're decorating their house again. And I said, you're always decorating their house. It's um, we're all laughing. Um, but it's just, ah, it's the next thing. Do you know what I mean? It, it's constant. It's on a whirl. It just goes round and round. And people have certain things. It's their thing. Um, and then you have spiritual snobs think, well, that's not really me. And they look down on people because that's their thing. But they've got their things as yeah. well. Um and sometimes I do because this is what I'm in this and I'm thinking about it. I look at people in social media, you know what it's like, you've got your Instagram life that people seem to have. Um, but it is only a snapshot of people's lives. But I do often find myself thinking and looking at them and saying, you come across as being really quite content. These are the thoughts I have. You know, that you you know, you've got a lot of followers, you've got a you know, acceptable attributes, if you like. You've got a great job. But I look at them and they're, they're living their life and they seem happy enough. But I think, I wonder, and I think to myself, do you ever hunger for anything else? Mm. You know, and I just think, what a trap that people can fall into. And as I've reflected in my life, I've always, in God's grace and mercy for me, is that he's never allowed me to just, that for that to be enough no matter what I've had and I would look at my friends and I would feel like the outside person looking in because they seem to be content or they seem to be able to get away with just how they lived whereas I never really get away with it because I always felt dissatisfied mm-hmm. um, and and I believe that's a God thing that God gives you that because as I look at people and I think to all intent and purposes in the world your life looks amazing but not enough and you wonder well I wonder you know um, and I hope that God has drawn people but we know that that doesn't always happen so or it does but people don't really look for it um, and none of these things are even remotely powerful enough to override pain think about it think of the pain that you have in your life at times or in the past where you've had the pain of friction the pain of loss the pain of feelings of being hurt, the pain of money issues, the pain of being judged, the pain of comparing yourself to other people, the pain of being at the other end of gossip, the pain of feeling inferior, rejection. You could add anything to the list, really, um, just through living life and what life throws it is. And because of that pursuit, people can therefore be driven to become. So if you've got all that stuff going on and you've got that pain and yeah you can find relief in all these different things and remember Mark talked years ago about relief you get relief for a moment but it still grows another relief it never really gets away because you're not dealing with the root problems of your life you're not um waging war against the flesh as we know now we wouldn't have used that language then but we know that that's a language now but because of that if you think of people out with even Christ and sometimes people in Christ to be fair um People in their 
drivenness to find that joy or happiness or contentment then become more selfish they become more judgmental and um, they then turn to gossip they feel depressed they you know they then compare themselves with others um, through the depression and it can also cause people to retaliate you know like because of what they're trying to keep um because or they're pursuing what they want back that feeling so if you've got something and you lose it you've got that pain so see instead of feeling the pain and loss and reorganizing your beliefs and your thoughts into the right place with god and letting god work all things out together for good you retaliate or you try and keep and you become selfish or you talk about people and it's all about trying to get that feeling back that you've lost and really it is just a feeling um whether you feel good you feel loved you feel worthy or you feel happy um and i'm sure you yourself will be able to think back over your life and you'll have plenty of examples of fake joy um that you've had um and as we know it's not really joy well not in a biblical sense anyway um i remember as i was studying for this i was looking back in mark's notes because God just brings his word, doesn't he? He brings it to remembrance. The Holy Spirit, I love that. It's amazing. Um, and he spoke about false fruit. Fake fruit. <coughs> and fake joy is fake fruit. Do you know what I mean? Fake joy is fake fruit. It's worldly feelings to give the illusion of joy. Um, joy is where Jesus and God is the object of our focus, our desire, our attention, our love and gratitude. And true joy comes from our delight in God and his gift of salvation. It's the person who's in Christ who bears the fruit of that relationship and has grown in their trust of that relationship. That's where something wonderful happens. Um, maybe you've not considered it before, but when I say that that person has stopped having that seeking mentality, when you know Christ and have a relationship with him, you realise there's no need to seek anymore. So before you, you knew Christ, you were always seeking, and I was always seeking, always seeking, always looking for the next thing. Um, but then when you come into a relationship with Christ at that moment, when you know that God is really real, that you are really forgiven, that you are a rotten sinner, and that God has granted you eternal life, you realise there's no need to seek anymore that because that's truly where your security comes from it's all in Christ and some is will know more than others for years being around that pragmatic church honestly see when I think about it you really could want to slap people couldn't you <laughs> and spiritually slap them and say it is so fake it's mm. such fake fruit it's frightening fake joy fake fruit fake striving, fake everything. Mm. I mean, no wonder people just, they just curl up, don't they? And well, well, they just fade away in that environment. And as we know, we used to always think, gosh, there's something wrong with us because we don't have all the, yay, joy. Well, good, because it's fake, that's how. Um, and again, I suppose it's looking at some of them and just thinking, and I still do sometimes. I think, gosh, these are so exuberant and <coughs> it's joy and it's this. But I just think, where is that really? Because it's not rooted mm. in the doctrines of grace. It's not rooted um, in God's true word about the doctrine of depravity and how bad you are. It's about how good you are and how great you can be in your best life yet. And... I don't know, I just, I just, I'm so, I've never been so grateful to be out of that movement and out of that um, fake Christianity through the finding of God's word in our church. We have a lot to be joyful for, to be fair, that mm -hmm. we've been totally removed from that. Um, some of you might know the story of Zacchaeus in Luke's gospel, it's in chapter 19, it's maybe something you might want to read later on yourself. Um, and it really is a story of the restoration of a seeking man. And I don't remember, I don't know if anyone's watched it, but I remember there used to be the Bible series on the TV. It was quite a new kind of production, Hollywood production. Um, 
and I always remember this story and it, I, just it's good sometimes to see things coming to life that you have an imagination for in your in your head and you saw this wee guy he was wee like me and he's away up this tree and there's crowds everywhere thronging everywhere and Jesus walks by and then Jesus stops and he looks up and he's like I'm coming to your house like for dinner and he's like oh my gosh and I just then think what must he have thought at that time? He's obviously heard about Jesus who's walking about and he's hated, he's a tax collector, he's a traitor to the Jewish people, he's robbed people of money. I mean, he's the lowest of the low in terms of what the Jews would actually um, judge with their spiritual snobbery. Um, and Jesus stops and just says, I'm coming to your house. That's that moment, isn't it? It's just amazing. Um, and... I imagine Zacchaeus like being in awe and thinking and fearful and just being like, oh my gosh, he's coming to my house. Is, is it tidy? I mean, have I got the dishes done? Have I got to meet him? Have I got to the house? Do you know what I mean? It could be all going on in his head. But anyway, what we know is, because the story tells is that Zacchaeus was changed by Jesus because it tells us that he repented um, his actions because he'd robbed people and Jesus said to him in verse 9 and 10, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Mm -hmm. And there was Zacchaeus, he robbed everybody and he said, I'll give them half them back. I mean, he was, he was giving way more back to the people he'd stole from than what he would have had to do under the you know, legal circumstances. And Jesus is like, today's your day. And you just imagine his joy. And if we know Christ, we can imagine the joy. But I just, I remember watching it and it was fascinating just seeing, oh, there's the, there's the guy there. Um, so, and if you remember, I did a teaching a while back about the woman with the alabaster jar, um, where she went to the Pharisee's house and she washed Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair and poured all her expensive perfume over him. Really, she did that from a deep joy. I mean, she put herself in a really difficult situation because people would have known who she was. It was a very religious situation. They hated her. They, they thought she's a true sinner, prostitute, whatever. I mean, really, they couldn't believe that Jesus would, one, even allow her to touch him. Um, but Jesus allowed her to start preparing him, you know, for his burial. And he honoured her and he says that everything that, that what she's done for me will be recorded for eternity as a memorial to her. I mean, and here's a woman who just was filled with joy because she was filled with gratitude because of what God had forgiven her for and she'd get eternal life. <clears throat> That's a life a joy. And if I think of that couple, what they went through, like that horrendous pain, I think of her and she would have been had a lot of fear and condemnation and people round about her hating her. Completely different scenario, but completely real. And these people are going to be in heaven. And as I've been listening to this so for days, I'm like, these people are going to be in heaven worshipping God. She's going to be there. So it doesn't really matter what your circumstances are. She's still expressing that joy. Um, and... I love what Spurgeon says, and this is paraphrased. He says, Joy is close when the sinner is experiencing reconciliation with God. How true is that? When you are, and it doesn't matter whether you're saved or you're constantly seeking God for forgiveness or you're drawn near to God, and he says he'll draw near to you. When that reconciliation, you feel joy. It's just a byproduct. Because God's spirit's in you. Mm. And if you're seeking God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength, then why wouldn't you experience joy? Because it's his joy. So if you're focusing on him, his joy is going to come. So it's just, it's just, you know, Spurgeon's got an amazing way, 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 way words. Knowing that your sins are wiped clean. But more so when we consider that not only are we forgiven, accepted, but we're loved by God. And that's joy. Just as an aside, my, I've just got a wee thought there. I've read something somewhere. I need to remember where I've seen it, but I might have been spurging and what he said is the hardest thing for a believer to really grasp is that God loves them. I think we can grasp that God forgave us. 
I think we can grasp that um, the mystery Jesus was hidden for generations and generations and that now it was revealed when he came, you know, when he did 2,000 years ago. I, you can believe all that. You can read the Bible. I'm quite literal. I just believe what it says. Um, but as a believer, it's a love that God has for you that people probably find the hardest to comprehend. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's quite true. Um, we also know about the woman at the well. When she met Christ, um, she didn't walk away from Christ with a perfect life. For those who might not know the story, this is a woman who had been married four times and she was now living with another man and she went to draw water from a well and she had to go at a certain time because no other women or anybody would be about because she carried a lot of shame. And it says in the scripture in John 4 that Jesus had to go through Samaria, a bit like Zacchaeus, he had to go there because he's seeking who he might save. Um, and when he met her and had a dialogue with her, again, I think it would be something that you could read in your own time. Um, when she left him, she never left him with a perfect life. It wasn't like ding, ding, ding and magic, like the magicians that you see with the with the black stick and the white and it pops out the heart and all of a sudden everyone's rosy. Um, but she walked away with a perfect joy because it's only found in him. That was the, he says, I'm the living water. I'll give you water that you'll never need to thirst again. That's joy. Um, so she went from going to the well to draw water um, to going into town full of love and joy for what Christ had done to her. And from John 4, verses 28, 29, and it says the woman then left her water pot, and she just left it, she wasn't caring about the water, and went her way into the city and said to the men, the men who would have known about her and judged her and all the rest of it, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did, could this be the Christ? And I often think of that it is my favourite story, um, just the line Jesus had to go through Samaria, I just think, I just love that, that the creator of the whole universe said to his disciples, no, I need to go that way. And he'd already known he was going to meet her on her own and save her. I just think there's nothing more beautiful. Um, and I just think that woman must have had some peace, which is the next fruit, isn't it? Um, from the love and joy that she was experiencing, that made her not fear any repercussions as she went publicly into the city and not by hiding. Isn't that amazing? That's what Jesus can do for you. Um, can give you courage, boldness, um, a voice um, to be his ambassador, to be a representative of Christ, to cry out without shame for what he's done for you in your life like nothing else. And I think only Jesus can do that for you because the world's too crazy and mixed up and judgmental and it's really went crazy now, but... It's again, it's that deep, close communion with God that gives you all these things. Um, and, we wage, and when we wage war against our sinful flesh, I'll always come back to it. We can then deal with the joy stealers in our life. If you've been like me and you've been listening to John MacArthur in the mornings, which I do um, sometimes, he's been talking about or had been talking about living a convicted life for Christ. And when I was pondering, listening, all the things I was talking about, I'm like, they all peas. He they all start they all start with a little a letter P. Um and it was pride, people, possessions and pleasure. I thought they are the idols, the idol of pride, people worship, possession worship and pursuing pleasure. Um and I thought, gosh, they are because Mark had been talking about idols as well, and I'm thinking, oh, they're idols. And we know they're idols because we hear about them being idols, but then you hear someone else talking about them and it just reinforces how much an idol they are in your life. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, I need to wage war against these idols in my own life. And when I thought about it, when we're full of pride, we lack joy. Mm -hmm. When we seek people before God, we lack joy. When we seek possessions before God, we lack joy. And we seek pleasures before God, we lack joy. And it just goes all the way back to what I'd said earlier about the world and how they think they've got joy and they're pursuing all these things and what Mark said on Sunday about it's not that you're not a pursuer or a studier, it's just it's your play it's your flesh that you're pursuing, no God. Um and having idols 
it will hamper God's spirit being able to be fully expressed in and through our lives, without a doubt. And we know that from the teachings that we've had already in the fruit of the spirit. So if we want to be like Christ, we need to wage war against our flesh. We need to wage war against pride, people, obsession, possession, seeking and have seeking and having a hold on us and pleasure, pursuing this at the expense of pursuing Christ. They're all joy stealers. And how do we know that? Because we've already got joy in us. And the truth is, if we get that and do that, it's fleeting, it's never lasting. Um so if we look at Hebrews 12 for a minute, um, we see it in the life of Christ. And this is me really coming up to close. We see that in the life of Christ himself, because he epitomises what joy is. And it says in Hebrews 1, 2, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Think about that. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It was the joy that was set before him. Um, was not long, you know, by Easter, and I had watched The Passion of Christ. I hadn't seen it for about 20 years. It was absolutely brutal. But again, it just makes things sometimes come a bit more alive when you can see things sometimes. Um, and what made Christ able to endure such pain, such shame and such agony? It was the joy of finishing his mission. The joy of beating death so that we don't have to. The joy of winning for us. The joy of everlasting peace with him. The joy of all who God had chosen now having access back to the Father because we were chosen before the foundation of the world and we were separated from God because of sin through Adam and then Jesus reconciles us back to God. It's really amazing. Um, Jesus' joy of pleasing God, the joy of obedience, the joy of the faith on the cross being with him in paradise, even at his dying death, Jesus, today you'll be with me in paradise. Just that joy kept him going to that end that he then said it is finished. The joy of the woman at the well being brought into the kingdom, family of God, because I think sometimes we don't think of Jesus as being fully God and fully human. I have to go there and see this woman. That's the joy. I'm going to go with her. It's the case I know up that tree. I'm going to walk by there, right? I'm coming to your house. The joy, imagine Jesus' joy, knowing that these people are going to, they're going to get saved. Imagine his joy in that. It must have been wonderful. Um, and ultimately the joy of glorifying the Father. And that's the joy that we have in us. It's beyond anything the world can give us. It's found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It is the fruit of his labour that we would walk in it. It's the fruit of his labour. His labour. I was reading scripture, scripture, um, it was in Colossians. Um, I've not got it for this, but it was actually going on after the scripture I'm going to read. And honestly, it's just how everything's created in Jesus. God sought fit for Jesus to have authority over all that. And I was just imagining this relationship, God the Father, God the Son, because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and it's the fruit of his labour. God the Father's delighted in his son that it's fit that you have that and then all these people are in you because everyone's created in and through Christ as we know through John's Gospel. Um, but the fruit of his labour. So we've got that fruit. So it's the fruit of his labour. But it says in Colossians 1 verse 10 to 12, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And that just, it's 
just an amazing piece of scripture and it just comes to life as we continue to learn more and more from Sundays, Tuesdays and these. You just see God's word. It's just everywhere. It's in everything. Um, you'll remember, the, I can't remember, I think it was Mark, it might have been Fraser, but I'm sure it was Mark. Mark had shared a story a, a few years ago and it's a great picture because we've been learning about faithful men um, and what it means to walk worthy of the Lord and, and I remember the story and I've been thinking about like the faithful <coughs> men because I think Callum's teaching even on Sunday it really really came to life you know um, how people are so courageous but again that man's joy you know like following Christ he was trying to save people you know preaching the gospel at the last minute and and I don't know if you noticed there was a picture and I was looking at the picture and I was just imagining people being there, those circumstances in there, that man, because I was considering joy and I think he is just not considering himself and being joyful and sharing the gospel to you, how you saved to that man and then the same time you saved and then he got saved and that man survived. It's just an amazing picture again of joy. It's funny how when you're studying something you see it everywhere. But anyway, the story was, you'll remember it, his name is Horatio Spafford, a Presbyterian church elder who was best friends with D.L. Moody. Mark spoke about this years ago. And he decided to take a trip to England in 1873, him and his wife. But before they left, he was called back to Chicago as a great fire had happened. So his wife, Anna, and their four daughters went ahead. And during the trip, their boat hit another boat. And floating in a plank of wood, his wife Anna made it to the shore in Cardiff and she wrote to her husband with the words, Saved Alone. All four daughters were killed. Spafford got into another boat and made his way over to be with his wife. I'm trying to graze dead sad. <laughs> While he was asleep, the captain of the boat awoke him and said, Listen, we're sailing over the part where your daughters had died. So he rose and he went and looked and he returned to his cabin where he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to see, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know the hymn because we sing it. And after him and his wife were united, they decided to spend their life, this is joy, the rest of their life serving children. And they both moved to Jerusalem and worked with the sick and needy. But mostly they brought in orphan kids mm -hmm. to their home and raised them in the ways of the Lord. How beautiful is that? Um, Horatio, he died in 1888 of malaria, whereas his wife, she went on to live for another 30 years, but she never stopped their work. Well, her work, their work. Um, and she actually expanded her work and included serving those who had malaria. Um, she continued to serve the poor and the sick and children until her death in 1923 and she was then buried next to her husband in Jerusalem. And again, is that not just a beautiful life full of joy? How many people would experience something like that and their life wouldn't mean anything and yet they've taken that and they went and just loved kids who never had any parents and raised them in the ways of the Lord. It's just a beautiful picture. God at work, his fruit, the fruit of his labour in people's lives. And I love that wee statement, the fruit of his labour. It's his labour, it's not our labour. He's already given us it. Um, so for us as women to be participants in living epistles of, of God, I'll just repeat that scripture in Colossians 1, 10 to 12 that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That is a combination of waging war against the flesh and pursuing Christ, and we have to walk worthy of what God has done for us in our life. And we too, God willing, if they, I'm sure as these people will meet God as a good and faithful servant, we, oh God, will be able to say as welcome, good and faithful servant. So let's pray. 
Father God, we just thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your precious ways. We thank you for your son Jesus, whom you sent to be the appropriation for our sins so that we can be reconciled to you, God. Father, I pray for each and every one of us that we would pursue you with all our hearts, with all our souls and with all our strengths, that we would wage war even when it's tough and when we fall down and get we need to get back up again against our flesh so that the fruit of your labour, the fruit of your spirit is evident in our life. And what will separate us from the world is our love for each other, your church, your ways and the joy that is expressed through the love and gratitude that we have to you for what you've done for each and every one of us that we could never do in ourselves because we truly are wretched sinners. And I pray, Lord God, if anyone here doesn't know you as their Lord and their Saviour, I pray that you would open their hearts so that they could experience that true love and that true joy and that true forgiveness that only comes from our relationship with you, that striving and pursuing things in the world will only bring hurt and devastation, no matter how fleeting the temptation, the good feelings or having stuff or being admired or accepted. It's all fleeting, Lord, whereas it being accepted by you in Christ is a true goal and a true precious gift that anybody in this life could ever receive. And we commit ourselves to you, Lord. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for our elders. We thank you for your word being faithfully preached that is sanctifying us through your word changing us to become more like Christ. Our prayer is that we would meet you, Lord, and you would say, welcome, good and faithful servant. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.